Let me give you an example of what I bet you hope will never happen to you. This is a patient who came to our department with a new epilepsy. This epilepsy was due to a brain tumor. And the location of this tumor is in a very essential region, which is called Broca's area, which is known for the production and conception of language. So what brain tumors have in common is that they are not only consist of tumor cells, but they are highly infiltrative, which means that the tumor consists of tumor cells, but also has inside the tumor working brain cells. And in a lot of cases, this brain tissue is still highly essential for the patient itself and for some of his most essential functions. So what do you tell such a patient about the therapeutic options of his tumor? Should it be resected? Or are you afraid just by the location? And you counsel him and tell him he shouldn't be operated on. So for a doctor and for me as a surgeon, it's quite hard to tell your patient that you can't help them because you're not sure if there is function or it is not. Of course, when we operate on the brain, we roughly know where function is located. For instance, motor function is located here, the so-called precentral gyrus, like for movement of your body. This is the understanding of language. As I told you, this is Broca's area for language production mainly. Social behavior. Arithmetic processing, which means the ability to calculate, and memory. However, this is in the healthy brain. We know that brain tumors actually impair the function of the brain and kind of cause a reorganization in some patients. In some, it does not. This means that motor function doesn't need to be here. It can also be here. The language doesn't need to be here. It can also be here. So. How do you know before surgery where this function is located and what do you tell your patient? Does it make surgery sense at all or not? So that's why in uh, 2010 we decided to leap forward and actually test a brand new application of an actually old technique um, for mapping brain function, which is called, a long name, Navigated Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation, or short, much easier NTMS. And what NTMS does is that it has a stimulation coil which is put on the patient's head, it's handheld, it induces a magnetic field which penetrates the skull, and it then hits the brain, and where it is in the brain, it elicits an electric field. And this electric field then stimulates or inhibits neurons. And the new thing is that um, we can actually navigate in the brain and visualize which point in small area in the brain we're actually stimulating or inhibiting. As you see here between the red and blue arrows. So we can really see in high resolution MRIs where we stimulate the brain. And if you then examine the response of the brain by electrodes on the muscle or by observing the language of the patient or even the ability to um, perform some little and easy calculation tasks, you can make a map of the brain. So it's a quite powerful technique. So in the last six years, we learned a lot of new things about our brain tumor patients and their functional anatomy. This is the fusion of the maps of the motor system of 100 brain tumor patients. You see in light blue the motor area for the arm and the hand, and in dark purple for the leg. And in pink, I draw in for you Again, the presental gyrus, which is the traditionally thought region for motor function. And as you see here, that the actual region in brain tumor patients where motor function can be is far more spread. So you can't just by anatomy tell a patient if you should operate him or not. Even if you separate these 100 patients in five different groups so that each group only has patients with the tumor in the same location, as you see here, you see that the region of the motor area is totally different depending on the tumor. So even the tumor location then determines, in a way, how your motor cortex is reorganized in the brain. And the same is true for language. I showed you earlier the yellow and blue regions, but as you see here in this heat map, 
where dark blue means a high rate of patients have motor function inside this area, this shows you how much more spread language function can be in brain tumor patients. So coming back to our patient, as I showed you at the beginning, for whom we couldn't tell where function is located. Because we assume just by location, this is a tumor we might not operate, and actually, it still happens. Today, we are able to perform individual maps for each patient, which we actually do a lot of times a week. It takes us two to four hours for each patient, and we can then counsel the patients and tell them about the risks and benefits of surgery, if it makes sense or not, if he has a high risk to lose some part of his language or motor function or not. And the same is true for children at the beginning at the age of two, we're able to also perform maps for them. And this is actually the case of a small kid um, who has two brain tumors, as you see here in orange. In blue, you see again motor areas, and in yellow and uh, blue, you see the fibers, which are kind of the cables which bring the information down to the spinal cord. And as you can imagine on these slides, with such detailed images, you can tell the parents much easier what the problem of the therapy is and if they want to do surgery or choose some other treatment. And you can show them in a way that they really understand the problem. Three years ago, we did a study on which we analyzed patients who came to our department for a second opinion because they were told their tumor is not removable. Out of 51 patients, we operated on 47. 74% of those had complete tumor resection, which means we resected all tumor you saw in the MRI scan. None of the patients with their first brain surgery in our department had any new deficit, although they were told they have a high risk and you shouldn't operate the tumor. In another study, we compared patients who were operated on without preoperative TMS data and those with TMS data. And we saw that the rate of complete tumor removal increased from 58 to 78 percent. However, this is actually just the beginning of using TMS in neurosurgery. There are some specialties who already use TMS, also non-navigated since decades, for pain, tinnitus, depression, but also for stroke. And what patients with stroke have as a main problem in many cases is that they'll suffer from a weakness of one side of the body. And we know today that if you have an injured half of the brain, half of the brain is called hemisphere, so if you have an injured hemisphere, the healthy hemisphere has inhibitory pathways which even makes the injured hemisphere even worse, so it inhibits the injured hemisphere. What we can do with TMS is that we apply inhibitory pulses, which is kind of an overstimulation, to the healthy hemisphere, and avoid that it makes the injured one even worse. And it works actually well in stroke patients, and it's a lot of studies. And we're actually doing a study now on our brain tumor patients, which is ongoing, who suffer actually after surgery from a problem with moving an arm or leg. And we had really amazing cases, some of them at least. We had an older patient who couldn't move his right arm and hand for five weeks after surgery. And then we did um, treatment on him with TMS. And after some sessions, he started to show movement in his hand. In another case, we had a young woman who could, right the day after surgery, not move her left side of the body. And at the seventh day of treatment, she actually walked to the treatment room. So it's not only for us, especially for the family, it was kind of a miracle. For us, it was also like a very strong treatment effect. But thinking even one step further, this is a PET scan. A PET scan shows you biological activity of tissue, which means it shows you where the, the tissue is most highly active and also where the tumor is highly active. And this is, again, a tumor in the so-called Broca's area. And I told you before, we don't know where language is, usually. So we did a mapping on him. And unfortunately, the mapping showed us right inside the tumor, 
This is actually a tree lingual patient. It showed us for every of his three languages that he has essential language function inside a tumor. So what do you do with such a patient? Do you tell them, well, we won't operate at all? Do you tell him, well, we remove some part of it? We try to remove everything, and it can happen that you cannot speak anymore after surgery. We can then try some TMS treatment. It might work, might not. Or you think one step further, and you apply to these highly essential brain areas inside the tumor, you apply inhibitory TMS treatment and make it much harder for the brain to actually produce language. And then you force the brain to find new solutions and reprogram itself. So finally, coming back to our knowledge about the functional anatomy of brain tumor patients, we know that this is different from healthy people. So we shouldn't treat them like they have a normal functional anatomy, but we also do not have to. Because today, we're able to perform individual maps. We actually do that on a routine basis in our department, several times a week. And we do that with the powerful help of brain simulation. And as I showed you today, this is just the beginning of this technique. Thank you very much.